Tere homigost. It's wonderful to be back in Tallinn. So today I will speak of uh, something a little bit different than the rest of the people today. I will speak about future uh, global migration trends. There are two features of future migrations that are certain. First, migrations will continue. Migration is a basic population dynamic as well as an adaptive strategy to changed circumstances of life. Second, while migration can be managed in many ways over the short term, it cannot be fully controlled in the end. Therefore, migrations will always include an element of unpredictability. We don't know exactly what is going to take place. So what is migration? It can be for one or several reasons. People can go and move for study, to work. It can be once or several times during your lifetime. It can be one way, you never come back. Or you can rotate, permanent or temporary, in other words. It can be voluntary, you leave because you want, like students do, this is very important. They want to go somewhere. Or it can be forced, you really don't have any much other of a choice. It can be national or international. And I think this is something quite important. We tend to think of national migrations as something different from the internationals. Let me take an example, and let's go back to Finland. In the 1960s, Finland was a country going through great changes. It was changing from an agriculture-based society to an urban industrial society. What happened in people's mobility? They moved to close by smaller cities in great numbers, also from smaller cities to larger numbers. And that's how the, contemporary, the Finnish cities got the flavor they have today, with the suburbs and concrete buildings and so on. But it didn't, didn't, didn't end up there. Many of these people were also moving to Sweden. Really, a lot of people went to Sweden to work. A few of them stayed there for a couple of weeks, came back, a few for a few years, and some for a very long time. And they returned to Finland, not back to the countryside where they may be left, but to the regional and bigger cities. That was return migration. When they were in Sweden, and also when they had returned to Finland, they went to the countryside during the summer. They had their summer cottages there, and that this is, I believe, why we have a very high percentage of summer cottages still today in Finland. I think this sounds a little bit familiar to you Estonians in here, if you reflect upon the last few decades of Estonian national and international um, mobility. So basically migration is a very messy phenomenon. There are a lot of things that uh, take place. Some of them are quite clear, some of them not. And uh, in, in, in this field it's, it's the most difficult issue to predict. If we take the basic demographic indicators of how people are, migration is the one in which you have ups and downs and flips this way and that way. You know, it can go, it, many things can happen. Of course, there are regularities, but in this context, I want to emphasize the unpredictability. Now, uh, what is the situation today? There are about 260 million international migrants today. This includes all the people, even those people who moved 70 years ago to stay in somewhere are still alive today, as well as those who moved yesterday or, you know, a year ago. The majority of world migrants at their age of migration are adults, young adults, sort of uh, 20s to uh, uh, late 40s, 50s, that is the, the vast group. But there are quite a few children as well, as well and then uh, men and women usually uh, uh, quite in similar shares. But again, there are very big differences between different countries and areas. So that's the basic situation today. Uh, in my view, among the key issues of future migrations are the following three of which I will mainly talk. It's global population growth, urbanization and climate change. And what do I mean with this? Let's take a look. So here I have the United Nations medium um, prognosis or uh, projection for population growth uh, for the coming uh, century. 
there are alternative figures also, and they range anywhere from 8 billion to 15 billion individuals. So this, with approximately 11 billion by the year 2100, is the standard one that is used uh, quite a lot. What we see here is that uh, there will be more of us with somewhat great certainty. So today we have about 7.5 million individuals on this planet. By 2050, in 30 years, uh, it's approximately 10 billion that we are expecting to have. The majority of future population growth is expected to take place in Asia and in particular in Africa. India will become the world's most populous country in the, in the coming years thereby surpassing China, that by the way is by far the largest sending country for international migrants in the world today. Many African countries will see great population growth and Nigeria will soon establish itself in the world's top five in terms of the size of population. Europe is among the few places where a population decline is taking place. Low fertility in many European countries is considered a threat for economic sustainability. And that is the key reason why international migration to Europe is viewed both as likely and also necessary by many. There are, of course, different views on this, as you very well know from your recent uh, elections, for example, and that is the same debates we have all over Europe, but I hope to return to this issue a bit later. Europe, or more precisely the UK, Germany, France and Spain, are the main targets for international migrants in Europe. Globally speaking, where do people want to go? If we ask people, where do you want to migrate? They say, United States of America or Canada. That's the second place. European countries come after, after that. Now, so uh, we may presume uh, that, you know, even if the the share of international migrants, a little bit more than 3% of global population, remains the same. So we can expect that maybe numerically there will be more in the future. Now, let's take a look at urbanization. Since 2007, more than half of this planet's population live in cities. The estimated share will be 68%, more than two out of three in 2050. During the following three decades, it's expected that only in China, some 250 million people will move to cities. So I'm not talking about numbers after this in this respect, but asking the question, what does urbanization mean? Moving to a city is not only a move in the place of residence where you live, it's also a change in culture. Urban life implies a changing means of livelihood, new social formations, and often a lessen, lessening, less dependence on your relatives, on your family. Urban life brings also new challenges to people's lives, including previously known difficulties. For example, the rise of socialism in the 19th century had its roots in the new realities of city life. Cities give birth to uh, new social movements. As I have an, a background in the study of religion, I will take now a few examples from that. So if we look at the past decades of major global urbanization that has been taking place, we have also seen the rise of new social, political and religious movements the world over. For example, the rise of Pentecostalism in Latin America Pentecostalism, for those of you who don't know, has been the fastest growing part of Christianity for the last half a century. And the rise of new Islamic movements in the Islamic world, in all their great variety, have taken place simultaneously as well as gained much of their foothold in urban environments. So what I wanted to say with this, uh, this thing is that cities have always been you know the consequences of socialism in this country, for example, from one perspective. And will also stay in the future, and probably more so than now, not only the economic hubs of our lives, but also the cultural dynamos of the world. So, 
While uh, the impact of population growth and urbanization, I argue, are very significant by themselves, it still remains to be seen how climate change will impact future population movements. Now, uh, this graph illustrates some of the sort of gathered knowledge in this area. We have to make a big uh, difference between uh, sudden onset events, events like hurricanes or floods or whatever you name it. This is, by the way, the thing that the story that the media is very efficient in telling us. Uh, with these type of events and those gradual, slow changes that over time change the way what, how people can live. So in the case of sudden catastrophes, uh, this has been studied to some extent. We know that people do have very little time sometimes to actually find uh, safety. Uh, they usually move across short distances to the closest place where they can be safe and I think this is the basic lesson. And they return home, if it's at all possible. They return to reconstruct their places, if at all possible. This is something uh, we should remember. Then there are things that are a little bit similar in type. So there is, for example, a draft. So, you know, not rain for long enough or too hot, like it's become also in some places. So over a relatively short period, you will lose some of your means of livelihood. Okay, what do people do in these situations? Okay. They are trying to create alternative modes of, you know, financing themselves, of making a life they might send you know, some of the family to work in a city to get some funding. They might still get some revenue from what they are doing back home. So they try to create new economic and social solutions uh, for these situations. But again, if the situation lasts for a long time, then some of these solutions become may, 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 may be maybe more uh, permanent. Sea, sea uh, level rise, erosion, and this is maybe one of the toughest things to um, give um, a reliable ideas, but how it looks, at, looks currently, that it's a little bit similar to my previous example. People are trying to figure out how to do, uh, where to go, but depending on the, on the level of damage and how much you can act actually adapt, there you might already start to see some long-term migration strategies among a larger number of people. And then, uh, you know, you ever thought about the fact that um, people live on this planet uh, from the jungles to the Arctic, I mean. And what does that, that mean uh, in this debate that I'm having here? It simply means that human beings have an incredible adaptation capability. I mean, if you can only live, you know, basically living out of uh, seals like uh, the Inuits did in up north or to some very, very diff diff different environments. So what I'm saying here that, you know, even if uh, conditions change somewhat drastically from the beginning over a longer period of time, we may expect to see all kinds of created solutions that people make up. So I'm a strong believer uh, in, uh, in human uh, creativity and uh, adaptation. So, uh, what we can say uh, to conclude this little debate. The, uh, the difficult issue with climate change and migrations is that while we have also evidence that it indeed heightens the likelihood of people moving, the actual moves are in many cases facilitated or conditioned by economic, political and other factors. So, for example, in the case of Syria, uh, that you know was so much debate, debated a couple of years ago with the um, number of um, asylum seekers uh, from the region arriving to Europe, uh, some people made a quite uh, direct link with uh, uh, climate issues in Syria, and then you know the the, the thing that followed after that. Uh, this has also been disputed basically by the fact that there are so many intervening factors that in this particular case also various other outcomes would have been possible. And I, I, I tend to believe in this. So there is a very big human factor in all of this. And this is, uh, now we are coming to the end of my uh, presentation and I will present here briefly 
um, uh, some ideas that were brought together by approximately 60 uh, individuals who have a long history of working in uh, migration-related issues. Uh, and they created these four future scenarios. Basically, you know, how political responses uh, factor into this picture. And they had this, uh, these four uh, things. Uh, the um, opening roads is kind of like their sort of good vision. It means simply that people are able uh, across international boundaries to work together on this issue and, uh, and, um, and, and so on. Uh, the report in itself is called Tomorrow's Worlds of Migration and Mobility. If you're interested in this topic, I recommend you read it uh, yourself. It's quite a long report, actually. The second one, uh, the My Country First, is basically saying that, um, that you know, you're inward looking, you look only at yourself. Uh, immigrants are considered a threat for uh, culture and society and whatever uh, you name it. Uh, and, and then, you know, it's basically, you know, shutting the, down the doors. And this is, of course, an effective strategy for some time. But if it's effective in the long run, that's, I think, it's debatable. The third one uh, includes a different vision of the world. It's called Technopoly. That is where, uh, in the age of digital and technological advancement, uh, the real power in this world will somehow be moved to these big IT corporations, you know, in one way, and state will retreat as the primary uh, governor of, of economic development, in a way. And there they consider that what we will see is a widening gap between the expert and the low-skilled labor market, whereas the low-skilled are basically excluded and the experts live pretty much in the world as we live uh, today. And the last one, World on Fire, I think it says it's all incapability to discuss ac across international uh, orders in this um, issue will, <laughs> will create all kind of difficulties and havoc. Okay, so this was my brief story uh, today, uh, talking about the impact of global population growth, uh, the associated development of urbanization, and then... Uh, putting up some things about climate change in our uh, toolbox of thinking, presenting these, you know, uh, uh, one report on uh, eventual political rather soon outcomes in this field. So with these words, I want to thank you for sharing this time with me. Tanana Vaga. Thank you very much. And do you have any clarifying questions to Thomas first? I don't see. So we can have also a short discussion on the on the topic. So uh, Auna discussed uh, international migration from the perspective of the University of Tartu, the, the biggest university in Estonia, and, and Thomas tried to outline the broad picture of the global migration trends. So do you have any comments, uh, ideas, counter-arguments, whatever related to these topics? I can make a start. So, Thomas, uh, you talked about these big, big trends. Uh, how would you uh, relate these to the topic of our conference and about education and, and study migration and what kind of effects there could, could be? If you're thinking, like many people these days think, especially younger people, you know, how I'm going to survive the horrible world in front of us? Okay, because this is how many young people feel today. And if this is your worry, I would say, uh, educate yourself. Yeah. The higher, the better. Really? Yeah. So this is like a very practical uh, uh, hint to uh, any person. Otherwise, I think that um, we're living now in a moment where migration is very politicized for various reasons. Some of these reasons are quite good and I think legitimate. Others are maybe, you know, maybe creating more problems than solving them. Um, and, uh, why I wanted to do this is that, you know, kind of like there are things happening in the background and, and if, if we forget these type of issues, then uh, I, I don't think that is good. How it relates otherwise to this, uh, uh, this topic, so if we look at the past, I don't know, it really doesn't matter if you look at past 20 years or 10 years or 30 years, we have seen a very big rise in the, in the level of international migrants the world over. So, if I remember correctly, uh, globally, is it more than 
10 million people, something like that. Some, someone else might remember the figures. Uh, so it's a, it's, an eco, it's a very big eco, economic issue in many, many parts of the world. International students are migrants who bring a lot of money with them, even though they are young and, uh, you know, they go to Starbucks and other things. So, you know, they, they still spend a, spend a lot of money. Um, but there's an, an, another element, and I think we don't yet know exactly what are its outcomes uh, because a lot of young people who will still have another you know 50 plus years of, of live haven't have experienced life in many other places how it will over the long term uh, create ideas of you know who we are uh, as a, you know humans uh, whether uh, because if we look historically we see that often these people who have been you know traveling around so they are the ones who get the new ideas and they are also you know the the creative people who bring forward new ideas so i think that that's that's a significant because there are so many people around who are doing that sorry for a short answer thank you any other yes please Ivar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, four different scenarios have been mentioned. Let's imagine that uh, first scenario was worked out in Europe by Germany and some other countries. Second scenario is USA Trump. Third is multinationals working for technology and uh, world in, on fire scenario for uh, some uh, failed states. Um, and now which scenario is in the interest of Nordic countries and how to regulate, to have one of these four scenarios, which international organizations they have impact to fulfill these dreams of one scenario you choose for us. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for pointing this out. Uh, you are very right in saying that actually uh, these scenarios are, uh, well, they are scenarios in the first place, but, but uh, I don't expect that we are going to see one outcome out of, uh, uh, out of this. I believe that we will see a lot of different type of outcomes of these were maybe some prototypes uh, for it. Uh, in the Nordic Baltic region, I think uh, it's really, really obvious. I don't think we have any other uh, sensible choice than uh, uh, if we think of this region, um, uh, firstly, it's uh, cooperation. We are all very small states. Okay, some of us are currently more prosperous in a global scale uh, than you know many other uh, states in, in this world. But in, re in reality, we are very, very small. Okay, we forget that. We think that we're bigger than we are. You just go and you know spend a city in Hong Kong, and you will remember you know how the world really looks like. So uh, I, I think the only solution for us is to cooperate. Then regarding what are the um, key international players currently, it's the European Union, of course, it's very significant in many respects. And I think it's also beneficial for, the, for, for this region to be involved in that. Uh, we'll see how the EU develops in the future. It may take many routes. Uh, uh, and also in terms of expert organization, of course, the International Organization for Migration is very, very uh, good to uh, deal with because they are one of the few um, um, institutions that do have a glo global touch. You know, they have their fingers in so many different places, though they understand what is taking place in many places. And, and in this, the United Nations Sustainable Development Go Goals overall, I think they point to the right direction, and they also include certain elements of migration in there. Thank you. Ah, Pavel, yes, please. Hello, greetings from Latvia. I wanted to ask a question to previous speaker or on international students uh, in Estonia. I know that you were telling about University of Tartu, but maybe you can tell about more overall general trends in Estonia and what about some uh, private institutions? Um, uh, yes, uh, um, the, the, the trend in Estonia is quite the same. There has been a very quick increase in international student numbers all over Estonia and then the 11% in Tartu universities are average in Estonia. We don't have many uh, private institutions uh, actually 
I may be wrong, please correct my old colleagues from the ministry, but I think we have we're currently just only one university and few uh, few applied uh, University of Applied Sciences. Uh, the numbers are bigger there and their strategy is to recruit uh, paying international students. Uh, but that's not, if you look at the whole number of Estonian students, that's the minor thing actually. So, and the trend is currently, and there is a big debate in Estonia going on, whether we should continue with this quick increase in international student numbers, uh, who pays for that? Uh, because uh, uh, in most of the universities, uh, the international students pay for the studies. Uh, Tartu University and Tallinn Technical University are the exceptions where we recruit to the master studies and especially of course, of course to PhD studies also students uh, who, uh, who don't pay by themselves but we see as the quality of the students and if you, if you look at the reasons why we, we, we need or why we want to have international students so sort of earning money from that activity is not the main reason. So it's rather the sort of academic quality is the main reason and therefore we, we have been, until now, we have been sort of paid for that activity. Not fully, of course, I mean, there are many students who are paying also for the studies, but uh, we don't see it as a kind of, a, I don't know, economic activity, first of all. So we know. Yeah, well. Aitäh, tälle mina räägin eesti keeles. Mina olen Merle Haruja. Ja selline küsimus, kuidas on võimalik toetada ehte neid üliõpilasi ja neid äh, õppijaid, kes on eri vajaduste ja puuetega? Kas meil neid ka on, kas me nende, nendega arvestame ja kuidas me arvestame? Aitäh. Ma saan aru, et see küsimus ei olnud välistudengitega, vaid üldse eri, üldse eri vajadustega, üliõpilastega seotud. Äh, arvestame ja tegeleme. Eelmisel nädalal just kohtusime kõigi Tartu ülikooli või enamike Tartu ülikooli kuulmispuuetega üliõpilastega ja rääkisime sellest, kuidas neid saab toetada. Täna on erinevad toetused neile, alati muidugi neid toetuse võiks olla rohkem, aga kui ma vaatan seda pilti, et mis saab puuetega inimestest siis, kui nad lähevad ülikooli seinte vahelt välja, Siis, siis, siis ma ütleksin, et, et need toetused, mida täna riik pakub nii-öelda üliõpilastele, kes on puuetega, on palju lahkemad kui, kui need toetused, mis, mis on siis, kui, kui, kui see üliõpne lõpetab õpingud ära. Et, äh, jah, ma ütleksin, et, et see suur samm, mis on puuetega üliõpilaste jaoks tehtud, et see on, see on nagu viimastel aastatel, ütleme nüüd, et see, see suur murrang nii ligipääsus, Pimedatele kuulmispuuetega, liikumispuuetega, et see on, see, on, see, on, see on tehtud, seal on palju asju veel teha, aga Aga see, kuna see ei ole täna pea teema, siis ma vist pikemalt ei peatuks, et võime pärast rääkida. Ja siin oli... Ei, sorry. Siin härra... Well, thank you. Uh, I'm Jan Verboom from the Netherlands. And I have a question about the internationalization of uh, higher education. Well, in the Netherlands... We have a very long tradition of uh, attracting international students. And I think about 50% of all master studies are given in English in the Netherlands. But the last years there has been more and more discussion about whether or not it's really desirable because of the quality of the education. Uh, there are doubts about the level of English of the international students. Uh, some Dutch researchers, Dutch uh, teachers, find it rather more difficult to, to give lessons in English than in, in the Dutch language. Uh, not all Dutch students are fully capable to participate in English. So there are a lot of discussion about the link between the English uh, courses given in the Netherlands and the quality of the, the courses. And my question is, well, do you have the same discussion in Estonia and what are your solutions to this uh, problem? Thank you. One, one quick and easy solution. <laughs> uh, no, of course. Uh, yes, we do have these discussions. Currently in our university, um, as I showed also, around 25% of the master studies uh, are taking place in English. Um, the questions of quality are mainly about the, the teachers' uh, 
quality of English language. Uh, that's one of the questions. If we look at the quality of the students, then in several fields we can recruit better international students than Estonian students. So, for example, in IT, that is really quickly increasing, and, and you, can, you can imagine that within one population, we don't have sort of Ill, unlimited number of students able and ready to study IT. And if we want to increase in this field in the labor market, or we, if we want to increase this, this, the number of employers, so we have to recruit international students. Um, but the discussion is all, of course, it's, it's a re really, I mean, somebody was applauding also. I think it's the, 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 the finding the balance. And as I said, we don't foresee a very quick increase anymore uh, in the number of international students. And, uh, and we really have the task from the ministry. And we, we, we see this, uh, the task of the national university, the Tartu University is, that on the two first levels, uh, which means bachelor and master, all fields must be taught in Estonian. So we are not ready to give up any of the fields. So it's, as I said, uh, until now, I don't see that, uh, that English uh, studies have taken any opportunity away from the Estonian students. So it's just something that we, we do in addition. Can I have a question? Yeah. <laughs> Not to myself, but uh, yeah. uh, I, I mean, I, I actually wanted to ask about the trends. You, you showed about the trends in uh, how the climate uh, change may affect the trends of, of migration. Do you know similar kind of uh, uh, forward-looking or trends looking for the international student mobility? So what, what will be... We have seen that the student mobility have been increasing during during last decades, but will that continue? Will that be a kind of a... I think we can make a... Dis I'm, I'm not a specialist in this, so I'm a, a little bit making up it now, but I think that you had a good point in there, because I really don't see these type of pro uh, estimates that you, you have uh, asked for, not that I'm aware of anyway. But I think that we can make a distinguished between two kinds of international uh, studies. One is, uh, let's say, from the more prosperous countries to other prosperous countries, and the other one is from more developing countries to the more prosperous countries, generally. And now, uh, if we look at how, you know, why do people move in general, then we see that, you know, uh, this is what the economists have found out, that, you know, as the countries, you know, as you know, general um, wealth, uh, increases, then we come to a point where migration starts to increase quite quickly because it's a way for a social progress, I mean, from an individual's perspective. And then again, once people have gathered some more, then migration kind of like decreases. It's not, no longer as an effective means of social uh, progress. So um, in my understanding, we will still be for a long time in a situation uh, if making the presumption that the world, you know, somehow as we have it today will continue along a little bit similar tracks as today. So we will see uh, great numbers of people uh, still in China, uh, in India, you know, to take Nigeria, whatever these really big, big countries that are entering those levels of, uh, of in income and, and, and opportunities that uh, for them moving elsewhere uh, is attractive. Okay. This is my understanding of the kind of like the big picture global dynamics. And this is also, by the way, why we see the Chinese and Nigerians and so on already now uh, in, in so big numbers in many places across the uh, uh, more prosperous countries, universities. So I still believe that this basic dynamic is there. Okay, but we might, what, what is more uh, difficult to say is that how the competitive environment in higher education will develop overall, and I have no, absolutely no clue what is taking place, but we see then that, you know, there are these franchises of, you know, some big universities that go, I don't know, they go to Gulf or other places, so it might be that some other solutions or some other technolo technological solutions might be affecting this business, but I think the basic demand will stay there, uh, you know, for several decades uh, from now on. Mm -hmm.